This is Podkit, episode 54. Too many quacks out there. On December 29th, 2019. And now, watch out for hindsight's in cars 2020. This episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad. This episode has show notes at the nexus.tv slash PK54. See you in 2020. Hello, hello. Hey. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the final episode of 2019. What? Wow, we're just days away here. How did that happen? Uh, you know, it's something about recording once a month, every three months. <laughs> well, you know. Very, very accurate for us. Though I think, uh, when when was the last time? We recorded, about a month I ago. Yeah, we did okay. a pretty good job. We did we're a pretty good job. Pretty good, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, one of our uh, strategic methods uh, for for podcast uh, in the future is to just pre-select three episodes in advance, dates and kind of pseudo topics, because that uh, kind of takes out some of the scheduling issues that we've had. If it's in the calendar, it will happen. Uh, you know? it, it it will happen more than it won't happen, at least. <laughs> no, <laughs> That's, no, yes. Yes. Uh, well, so uh, happy holidays and uh, almost happy New Year, I believe. Is that right? Something like that. Nearly there. 20, 2020. Uh, any any big stuff coming around for 2020 these days? Uh, I'm told hindsight is 2020. Ooh. That's a, that's a good one. Yeah, you know. It's um, uh, definitely not going to get tiresome in a few hours. <laughs> Just a few hours. Sure, Just a few hours. It's going to be a whole year of it. that joke. It's perhaps already tiresome yeah well i will say you're the first person to say that and me realize that it's nearly about to become like a thing that everyone's gonna say so oh yeah it's gonna be the there. worst the worst twitter meme 2020 can have little a hindsight as a treat well you know uh since it is a uh, holiday season at this time of year uh you know i wrote uh, a christmas card of some sort but it's not really a christmas card it's more of just a a card that I give around to people this time of year. Uh, but I did a little bit uh, of a different thing this year. Instead of writing cards for every single person individually, and I know too many people now, I wrote one card, and I made a postcard version of that, and I gave it to everybody. Um, your cards are in the mail, but uh, you might have heard there was a snowstorm or an ice storm. Oh, man. And so uh, your cards are delayed. <laughs> That is okay. I had Amazon oh, packages good. also delayed, so if and the buses stopped in all of yes. the twin cities. Yeah, that never happens. That was pretty bad. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll mention the card here just a little bit. So, uh, this is a Gatsby website. Uh, I don't know, Brandon. How, how do you like Gatsby these days? You know, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's all I'll say about that. About a month ago, I uh, tinkered with extracting a bunch of my um, branding components out of the main website, putting them into a package, and the reason I did all that work about a month ago was so that I could do this by having one set of assets and just reusing those components wherever I needed to. So you can even see the uh, GitHub repo with those assets in it, Uh, you know, a few, few, few kilobytes of assets here and there, and it works out pretty well. I have to do some weird stuff to get it to play nice. Um, style components are weird. I have to use this thing called Yelk to be able to actually work with them locally. Very strange. But it is pretty cool. Five stars. That, <laughs> yeah, five stars, all right. Uh, it is pretty cool that I'm able to uh, have sort of a theme carry over across different web websites. Pretty nice. It's a great use for a component library. Yeah. So that's uh, that's pretty much what I did over the past uh, month or so in terms of development. Uh, I don't know. Do you, did you hear about how December you don't do anything? It's really weird. It's amazing. Yeah, time just like suddenly is gone. Yeah. You blinked. Yeah, I was joking on Twitter with some folks about taking all of the fourth quarter of the year off. And while I didn't do that, I almost did that kind of sort of while also still working. Which is not what taking time off means. No, that's that's exactly what I do as well. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I just worked on different stuff, different stuff than I usually do. 
So there you go. Mm hmm. So actually, I have been uh, I haven't been using Gatsby. I'm still using Next.js because that's that's the way I live my life these days. Um, but I did something kind of interesting recently. So my website, Brandon.mn, uh, which you might remember from the footer, uh, or not the footer. I guess it's kind of the footer. What is what? How do you describe the footer of a podcast? Is that an outro? It's kind of an outro. Yeah, yeah, something yeah. like that. Uh, you might you might you might remember my website Brandon.mn that I mentioned in the outro. Uh it's it's using Next.js. Uh and it's I, I'd written the styles from scratch as a little birthday birthday present, not a birthday present, a going freelance present to myself uh last year. Uh and it was fine. Uh it was just, you know, it was just whatever. Um, but I realized that, uh, so, so this website, Brandon.mn has gone through a couple of iterations. The first one was a Glimmer app. Uh, so Glimmer components are kind of the, 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 the template VM that underlies, uh, the latest version of Ember, uh, on recommendation from a friend of the show, Max Furky. Uh, and, uh, it, it was really cool. It was really great. But, uh, that was like my first exposure to a lot of different things, not the least of which being Glimmer. Uh, so over time, I kind of moved away from that a little bit, and I moved it over to Next.js. Uh, the entertaining thing about moving it over to Next.js was I uh, was uh, I made a, a, a series of bad decisions because I was just doing this kind of for fun while I was already working really hard, uh, long hours and stuff like that. So I never actually checked that into version control. Uh, and so... Uh, basically the site up until a couple weeks ago was exactly the same as it was a year ago when I first rewrote it in, uh, for, for, for Next.js. Um, so all the styles were totally handwritten. It didn't really flow quite right. Um, but you know, I had fun and I was doing it as a little like gift, gift to myself. So it, I wasn't, I wasn't too worried about it. Another thing that's kind of entertaining about this is I actually found that the uh, I, I had to reimage my laptop over the summer because there were some uh, display issues with my uh, uh, with my Mac, uh, and so I had to mess with a couple of uh, 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 well, basically what I found is I lost the source code for the version of the website that was live because the way it works uh, or the way it worked in the past was I would export it locally and then. Uh, using the AWS CLI, mm -hmm. upload the built artifacts directly to S3, and that would be how I would deploy. And I was like, that's kind of annoying. I don't really want to do that, especially when it discourages me from uh, from pushing this to GitHub. Uh, and so what I've done is I've kind of rewritten uh, that a little bit. So now we're using Tailwind for the styles, which is all well and good. Uh, more on the styles in a second. Uh but uh, the other thing that's interesting is I moved over to using Netlify, uh, which was which was something I had on my mind for quite some time. I've always been a little uh, weirded out and skeptical by Netlify and they're like VC funded sort of thing, uh, kind of like Gatsby in that sense. Just like, why? Why are you seeking funding? It's a little weird. I don't understand it. It's less weird that Netlify is doing it because they actually have to run a service. Right. Gatsby didn't have to run a service, but they chose to. That's very true. That's very true. They chose to run a service, and it's not really clear why. Uh, but I, I will say it's been really nice using Netlify. I moved my domain over. It used to be run through Route 53, which, by the way, I should probably remove it from Route 53 um, so that I'm not charged the extra dollar for managing it um, while it's not even using those, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, root DNS name servers. Um, but I've found the Netlify experience to be pretty solid. It deploys on push, um, you know, free built-in Let's Encrypt. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty darn satisfied with, uh, with that setup. And of course, I'm not really using Netlify to its fullest capabilities, uh, but I'm more than happy to just run that exported static site uh, with them in the meantime, because man, does it take a lot of... Uh, guesswork and effort out of it to even just have let's encrypt manage the cert rather than having to use amazon's weird cert portal that complains that it can't reach the domain that it owns in route 53 um so there you go that's a little that's a little bit of that simplification you you, it you were almost as easy as my uh, jekyll site on github pages yeah yours <laughs> is probably a little easier yours is probably a little easier 
just too, it's just too brave for me. I, I I refuse to take part in the in the in the Netlify lifestyle. I getcha. I getcha. I I had a bad experience with GitHub Pages once that was very dumb. But uh, did did I ever tell you guys about this? Um, um I don't know. Maybe I used a no. private. I I had a private repo that mm-hmm. was mapped to GitHub Pages, and then when I converted my account down from a paid account to a free account, when GitHub's whole what call it thing happened. I opted to, uh, what did I opt to do? Private sites lost GitHub pages. And I was like, oh, that doesn't really matter, right? Um, but what happened was somebody else registered that domain in GitHub pages. Mm-hmm. And so they were able to take control of my domain because everything was still pointed at GitHub. Yeah, now, no, that's just bad. A, it was just a dumb site. But I, I, you know, I wrote a support ticket and I was like, hey, this is dumb. This person is, you know, taking over something that was mine. And they're like, well, you, you know, you said to turn off GitHub pages. And I'm like, well, yeah, I said to turn off GitHub pages. But I, you know, you should have a warning there that's like, repoint your DNS, dummy. Right? Um, yeah. Yeah, I remember like, seeing uh, several cases of that on when that switch happened. It was yeah. the, you know, light... Uh, minor freak out of the the week of that particular yep. week yeah we have lots of those uh in in, in uh all, all around the world but i think particularly in tech we have why is javascript angry right that's the whatchamacallit that's the that's the meme yes yeah that was one of them but so yeah, yeah as a result worse. as a result now i'm like all right i only want to use tools that validate domain ownership <laughs> Cool. Well, um, for something a little different, um, the last couple of weeks at my work, I've been working on a another tool, like more of an admin tool. And so uh, some different kinds of requirements, different code base. And so I've used this as an opportunity to um, use a new library. So I think I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but um, you know, you know, React hooks, right? I've heard of them. And you know, like promises and and using like fetch to to get data out of a out of a restful service. Oh yeah, all the time. So what if you combine them together? You would get a hook that does fetching. Exactly, and then if you throw a bunch of like caching and stale data invalidation and linking together one request to another, you get something like React Query. So this is a really cool um, hook library for. Um, fetching, caching, and updating asynchronous data. So um, it's it's another library by Tanner Lindsley, hashtag TanStack. Um, <laughs> so from the, the same um, place as React Table, React Form, React Charts. Um, so it's like a one-liner to, to add in, and you can, if you have already used um, some sort of promise to fetch data, you can use that same function exactly and put it in this hook, you give it some sort of um, query key, and you can make a unique key for that query based on the parameters, um, and it will use that those same parameters to call that um, promise resolving function um, to call your data. And so it's super easy. It returns you know, uh, something like data is loading, error, also is fetching, a refetch. Um, so, so basically, I think with the default settings are something like five minutes. So if you make a request it'll cache that data for five minutes so every time you call it again in the future if the parameters and that key are this the exact same it'll just return it for memory if it's been after five minutes it'll um, delete it garbage collect it um, and it will fetch it again the next time it's called um, there's also um, like stale data configuration so um, if you have a component that fetches this data um, it'll load the cached version but it will be stale, so then it will refetch it again, even though it's cached. So you can present the older state of of that particular data and then refetch the latest version without having to show like blocking, loading, even though you just loaded it. So it'll let you use that older version. Um, this is like particularly useful for things like a dashboard or something where you have a bunch of data and you want to keep it updating on its own. React Query can do all that for you. Um, without having to really set up much of anything. And you can, of course, configure those times per request or or globally for all in a subtree. Um, 
let's see what else was there and there yeah so there's kind of two loading states so there's the initial fetch but there's also that like stale invalidation um you know kind of background update as well um, and then you can also link together requests through um i believe they call it mutation so um if you have let's say um some data that you you fetch but you have elsewhere some settings or something you need to post to your API that would change what that data would be. You can link them together so that when you post one, it invalidates the cache for the other one. So mm -hmm. we'll refetch the other one right away. Yeah, it's super cool. Um, I've really enjoyed using it and it's super easy and I've only gotten to just the start, but it's um, at this tool at work. But for like a type ahead, it's great because you can, usually you're not on a type ahead for more than a couple of minutes. So you have a cache time of like five minutes. Uh -huh. You know, every every, and I am debouncing at like 200 milliseconds, but if you type like the word test and then later you type test again, it's instant because it's not even making a request. Right. It's a really That's good awesome. user experience. Um, yeah, I've really enjoyed it. It's an awesome, awesome little tool. That's cool. Super cool. So how do you how do you feel about having all of that? What state is it in and caching logic? How do you like having all of that tied into your React tree? Um. I, I don't mind it. So I, I work in the analytics space. So it's it makes sense for me because it's going to be um, tied into the tool I have at work, which I haven't used this library for, but I would like to at some point. Um, it's very router dependent. So the you know the URL is the sort of source of truth of where you are, and it's reusing components in different URLs um, based on the URL that might have some different um, location. Yeah, like a React router params kind of flowing in which changes the requests so um based the components are kind of generic and so based on the urls um let let the whole tree figure that out because we don't have any sort of global you know redux store that is keeping track of all of that so if you're using component state already it's a really nice just drop in um and it is kind of then storing that outside of the component tree because it's under the hood you know adding uh, query keys to an object that mm -hmm. is storing all of these requests. Yeah, I, I've done, I've I've made apps that kind of do some of this, you know, caching and hold on to it for a little bit, and then if it's old, get rid of it, but keep it until the new stuff comes back. And it's a lot of work to manage yourself, but one of the cool things about storing it outside the React tree is then you can test and exercise all of that logic without having to ever mount anything ever, which is pretty cool. Yep. Yeah, because then they're just pure functions. There's also a prefetching queries, which I haven't looked at. Forgot about that one. That's handy too. Um. Yeah. I would love to even play with this library more. There's some yeah, I just suspense, saw that here. suspense mode support, um, server side rendering. Yeah, I, yes. I've when hooks were very new, I looked for several examples of async fetching libraries and i found one react request hook which is tied very mm -hmm. closely to axios like you can only use it with axios mm -hmm. and it works pretty well um but this is a little more robust um and i think it's um, a little more um i mean definitely more featured but um better aligned with how i use data in my apps at work so uh, the other library I've been using a little bit lately is React Spring. So I did talk about this a little bit this summer after seeing a couple of talks at React Rally. Um, so this is a like a Spring animation library for React that um, does a lot of the the animation rendering outside of the React render cycle, mm -hmm. um, but still very much closely related to the React render cycle. Um, it's a little a little automatical for me. I don't know exactly how it all works, but it is very cool, um, super powerful, and the animations are super smooth, very natural feeling because it's using some light physics simulation um, for like a, a spring. So similar to like native um, animations that you see on iOS or Android, I'm going to go with iOS because that's what's normal to me. So just the like... Um, rubber band effect when scrolling, the inertial, inertia stuff, just the subtle transitions. This is what React Spring is really good for. Um, so I used it to build a expand collapse 
um, shared hook for like a side navigation bar. So you can toggle sections and open and close them. Um, Mm -hmm. And so not, you know, I had, we had something built with CSS using a max height, but um, if that max height was taller than the element that you were expanding, there'd be a delay because the max height would be taller than the content. So it would be transitioning the height you know, beyond what you could see. And so it wasn't really doing anything. And then suddenly then everything would collapse. So there'd be a little bit of a delay when closing and not when opening. But um, CSS transitions aren't like pausable or cancelable. So they kind of stack and behave differently than you would expect. And so this one, you can fully cancel it midway through and it will continue from the state where it was switched. So if you like click a button really fast and it's a transition over a quarter second or something, you can you know, step it halfway through and kind of have a partially open, partially closed area in this example. So super nice, super powerful. Um, uh, It took quite a while to kind of wrap my head around and get something working, but um, it's, it's pretty cool. Once you get there, Um, they have um, the use spring hook, which is kind of around one, one uh, animation or transition. There's use springs, which lets you kind of uh, stack multiple things together. Um, Use trail, use chain. I think those are for like multi-stage transitions or animations. And then there's use transition for um, kind of moving from one element to another. So like a page transition or your um, you when you're mounting and unmounting components, it's helpful for that. So the kind of concepts of like um, from to but enter and leave as well which would be um like mount and unmount so that's more kind of how something like i think react transition group works or similar concepts so yeah it's a super cool library and i want to play with it more it's fun it's pretty cool um when you include that in your bundle how big does it get like how how what what is the impact I'm looking the other way. Um, <laughs> so I used, so this expand collapse, I went all the way and went, um, it transitions from height auto to height zero. Mm-hmm. So um, the initial render, if you start with it expanded, is height auto. And then it uses, I use the hook use measure, which is on NPM as, as use dash measure. And it brings in a polyfill for resize observer. So there's that plus React Spring, which I think is around 10K GZIP. So it's not light. No, 10K is fine. Um, I need to work on, you know, optimizing code splitting and things. But I think the idea is that when you have a library like this, adding some subtle things here and there across your app really can help make it feel much more native and uh, really powerful application it's the subtle things and it can give some give a user something to see while they're waiting for other things to load i i've i've talked with people about this kind of thing where they get worried about bundle size when they add a library like this and what i've explained to them is if you accidentally add one jpeg and you don't optimize that jpeg before you put it into your into your site or app and it's over 400 kilobytes, you've blown everything that JavaScript has anything to do with out of the water. Mm. Now, to be fair, parsing JavaScript is more expensive than transmitting it over the wire, generally. Sure, but 400 KB, it still takes forever. True, true. That's one one image. Um, And then, if that wasn't bad enough, every time you have an AJAX request, you are hitting who knows how many servers and going through how many, at least in our line of work, how many different firewalls and proxies and network translations. Usually that the, the, the bundle size of the app doesn't matter nearly as much as a hundred other things that also are terrible. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you shouldn't optimize it. It's just for a lot of the corporate stuff we end up making. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Not worth hand rigging over. Yeah. Well, cool. Uh, you know, when we were here last time, we were talking about Redux a lot. Yeah. Ah, yes. Yeah, the um, Redux guidelines had just come out, which was kind of funny that it took like 10 years for those to come out. 
Okay, maybe it wasn't really ten years, but it felt like it. Five at uh, well, yeah, five, right? Wasn't twenty fifteen? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Uh but what also had just come out at the time is the Redux toolkit. Now that's not actually even accurate. The Redux toolkit is actually renamed from the Redux starter kit, and they renamed it because they felt like people would see the word starter kit and say, hmm. Well, that sounds like it's not advanced enough for my very complicated needs. I probably shouldn't use it then. <laughs> so they renamed it to just Redux Toolkit. And it's 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 basically a way for you to get started with Redux stuff in a kind of on-rails and simplified way. So if you look at the Getting Started Guide, you'll get a configure store, which includes uh, a few different default middlewares, but most importantly, it, re- it includes Redux Thunk and uh, the DevTools extension turning on middleware. Uh, and it can, you know, give you all your reducers and stuff. It has a utility to create a reducer without a switch statement. So you just give it a map Ooh. and you just give it action name, colon, whatever function you want it to run, whenever that action name comes through. It includes Emmer by default. So you get to write normal kind of. Uh, it's kind of counterintuitive to me, but you get to write normal mutation based code instead of normal, like non destructive, you know, refresh the entire state of the tree kind of code. You get a create action utility, um, which is kind of cool. Uh, so you can actually use the actions as the action names, which is kind of interesting. Uh, you get a create slice, which lets you um, just kind of get parts out of a reducer and then you get create selector which is re-exported from reselect which allows you to sort of level up how you selector works internally so this is kind of their approach of kind of simplifying the redux process and kind of giving you a create react app like experience but with redux which is kind of neat yeah i've i've looked at or watched this as mark's been building it and I've I've been really intrigued to be like let's let's dive all the way in and add all of this stuff, and I'm like I don't really need it, but it would be really cool to use something like reselect and immer, but um, it's so much different and uh, Redux isn't a huge part of the application I work on day to day, so it seems a little overkill, which is kind of related to the bundle size thing that you were just talking about. Um, if you're building a really Redux dependent app, I think all this stuff is really good to include. Um, just like late late stage applications, I don't know. Yeah, I agree, and 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 this is obviously coming out so late in the life cycle of React and Redux mm. that most people already have mature apps today. But if you were starting up something new, I would uh, give this a look because it um, certainly does simplify a lot of the things that you have to do. Uh, you know, you almost always want Thunk, you almost always want debugging. Um, I, I'm kind of surprised having Immer in there because that makes your code much less in portable is a weird word to say for that, but it makes your code less portable because you couldn't, it, it, it requires any code you write forever in the future. If you want it to have interop with this code to also use Immer. In my mind, that feels like the same, like, I don't feel like I could use this for the same reason I don't use create react app right right like i mean well you know apocryphally i don't use create react app of course i literally use create react app but like back in the day create react app used to include that service worker by default and that was just constantly causing problems for people because somebody um somebody decided oh everybody wants a service worker and all you have to do is comment it out but it's like no nobody nobody ever wanted this and it's just causing dumb browser problems that no, that people don't know the origin of but you know eventually they they do their googling and they find out oh yeah somebody decided i wanted a service worker um it feels like immer immer's inclusion in this is kind of similarly misguided to that um well so they have they have if you look at the usage guide they'll have ex- they have examples on why including immer here does make a profound difference in code uh, repetition and code length and sure. code complexity. Sure. But I totally agree. It's just, eh, sure you want to tie your code up in Immerland. Yeah. 
it's it's yeah, yeah it, it's it's like uh another example of trade-offs that i just don't agree with and that's all on right. the other hand what if this had been sold to everybody as well this is just redux and we use immer internally for everything uh, well maybe we would maybe we wouldn't have known better all along and we wouldn't have cared exactly exactly yep but it's too late yeah the, the that ship has sailed I really like so the... we need to make re redux. <laughs> I really like the pattern of the create reducer combined with create action, where you have the properties on the like reducer object. Yep, and and you just import them, so you don't have to pass all these strings around. You just say, yeah. you just do it by reference, which is very type safe and, uh, uh, it's like compilable, right? Yep, and and it also makes it so that you don't have to do all of that. Uh, Redux ducks stuff that everybody likes to talk about. Yep. Too many too many quacks out there, you know. Yeah. On the topic of immutability, the weirdest thing. Um, re- remember the uh, let versus const war that just happened? Oh yes, I surely <laughs> do. Oh, I was so happy to not really be paying attention to that. Somebody should uh, find a uh, couple of tweets for that. It was Christmas, right? It was a Christmas Eve or day that it yeah. happened. Like what? Um, I will link a Cassidy Williams uh, TikTok in the show notes because it was very good. Actually, I'll do the other tweet version because that's probably more up the alley of our listeners. No, this is a good TikTok. I was actually hanging out with some friends from work on uh-huh. Friday, and um, one of them, one of their girlfriends, was like, "Hey, is everyone here a developer?" And we're like, "Yeah." She's like, "Okay." And she pulled out um, her phone. And just from like the first half second of that video, I'm like, oh, it's Cassidy Williams. She's like, how did you know? Like, I'm on, I'm, I'm, I watch these things. Right. That was an important cultural moment that let versus const and all the discussion. I mean, not cultural really, but you know yeah. what I mean. Internet, everything's a big deal. And then it's not very quickly. Okay. Well, so what did, what did we conclude with the let versus const story? Nothing matters. <laughs> I don't remember seeing any like definitive conclusion. I'm going to still use const, but whatever. Me too. Yeah, I um I'm going to do that as well and uh I'm in the position of teaching a bunch of people a bunch of things regularly and I will continue to say use const first and if you want it to be mutable later as in reassignable then use let. Uh Yep. It is super it is super confusing though, and I, I agree with everybody who points it out that it's not about mutability, it's about reassignability. That's uh that's a bummer. But I don't know if you've ever used Java before, but you can make an array list final in Java and then change any of the objects that are in that array list anytime you want. It is the exact right. same story, and nobody blinks an eye at that. And yeah. so I don't care much about this discussion. Const is fine. And, just use const. And we all know it gets compiled down to var in the end anyway. <laughs> Not always. <laughs> so only only if you have that turned on still. Oh well, everything I've literally ever written at work has always had that enabled. So oh, you know what? That is kind of funny. Wah, wah, wah. Maybe it'll all get compiled down to let eventually because let is is two characters shorter than const, and that's that's big savings. <laughs> You know, that's not a bad point. <laughs> yeah. So it's time for new Twitter followies. Yes, I will. I'll, I'll start because I have them in the show notes. Um, we totally forgot to to make this when we started recording the episode. So, oh, man. So I, I just put two. It was a little lighter this month for following. Um, so the first is the National Weather Service Twin Cities, which is NWS Twin Cities. Got to get your weather, especially in the winter in Minnesota when it's thrilling um and then the other one is darknet diaries maybe i've talked about this on the podcast before but it's a fantastic podcast um their their tagline is true stories from the dark side of the internet they've had some really good episodes this fall um starting with um there's a two-parter about the uh xbox 360 hacker group i forget what it's called um and there's a recent two-parter as well about um the shadow brokers and then not petya um Mm -hmm. Really, really interesting stuff. Um, I read a big article about Maersk and their um, rebuilding of their entire network over the course of a few weeks. 
um, That's as right. a result of not petty yet. Wasn't that a New York Times article, like or New Yorker yeah. or something? Something like that. So this this covers some of that a little bit as well. Um, yeah, super interesting. Like I've absolutely loved every single episode I've listened to. It's like probably one of my favorite new podcasts this year. Like, or it is by far. So I would totally recommend listening to this. It comes out a new episode every two weeks. Um, yeah, check it out. Seriously, it's good. Nice. Well, I only have one new Twitter followee that I'm going to mention because uh, I did not uh, prepare. Uh, and that is Meme Appetit. So it's <laughs> twitter.com slash Meme Appetit. And it just takes little little screenshots from uh, the Bon Appetit uh, test kitchen uh, videos, of, of which there are quite a few. And, um, you know, that's uh, that's just about it. And, you know, I, I appreciate a good cooking show and because I'm, uh, this, that's, that's, uh, that's where my head's at right now. Uh, you know, there you go. That's a, it's a little meme account based on a YouTube series about folks who work in a test kitchen. Nice. Gotta, just, gotta have those memes. Just wholesome and, uh, wholesome and very nice. So there you go. I like it. I did actually follow somebody, um, but I don't know who it was. I read their tweets for about 10 minutes, and then it's like, nope, can't have that on the timeline. And I unfollowed them. So I don't know who it was anymore, but they're oh, gone. Now. That happens. It, I do that too. Uh, well, you know, it's it a happens. test test trial. Like, can I stand reading these things for a day? No. No, I couldn't. I think I tweeted something along the lines of, uh, if if you can't handle my, my silly tweets, then uh, we probably shouldn't be, be talking in general. Uh so there you go. I th- I feel like I'm on yeah. the same page as you there, Ryan. I can't find that tweet now because I've only tweeted 10,000 times between then and now. Wow, that's that's terrifying. Um there there is a person who I was chatting with on Twitter and I eventually did follow though. Uh and that is Bruno here and um I was doing some work on some spring stuff, some spring java stuff a week ago and uh I was getting some really good help um from the Angular friends that we have and the Java friends that we have. So that was really fun. Well, cool. We made it through 2019. Yeah, that was a blistering episode. Yeah, I don't know oh, how we not, did it. In a good in a good year. Yeah. Oh. So, speedy, speedy. um what are what are your plans for next time? Oh man. Well, I'm headed to Austin in a couple days uh to do a client workshop. So I'll be out there for uh probably about nice. a little less than a week. And uh, got a couple days built in there to just hang out in a place that's not cold and rainy and terrible. Um, so it should be it should be kind of nice. It'll be a brisk 40, 50 degrees. And uh, I don't know. I'll do some work, relax, check out the many, many WeWorks in Austin. Um, and uh, then uh, then we'll probably have the next pod kit pretty, pretty shortly there after that, a couple weeks later. So... Just uh, kicking off some new projects and drinking some coffee and making some food. The rest is history. Great. Wonderful. How, how about you uh, guys? I have a hell of a month coming up. I can tell you I will be drinking coffee as well. Um, I'm a uh, lighting designer for a show for the Young Artist Initiative. Um, Ian's actually the sound designer as well. Um, and what show is this? this Frozen one? Junior. Nice. Okay. So it's a theater company where all the actors are kids. Um, eight, 18 or, or younger um, and the production staff for all adults um, it takes place in the Wellstone Center so our tech week our load in starts on J- Saturday January 4th and the shows are the weekend of uh, Thursday the 9th through Sunday the 12th so I will be busy and there every day from that Saturday through that Sunday the week later um, and then a few days after that I will fly off to Vietnam for 12 days for a nice January vacation so I'm gonna be busy. Oh man, that's right. I forgot about that. That's awesome. Yeah, so that's cool. that's my month. I really that's all I got. Uh, I'm gonna finish watching Mr. Robot on uh, January 1st, and I just started watching The Expanse season four. I watched episode one last night. So uh, we gotta talk about that Expanse show sometime. Yeah, that would be a good second opinion. And I will be watching The Mandalorian on a plane flying to Asia as well. So I got some TV coming up, some work, some <laughs> travel. Yeah. Cool. What about you, Ryan? Uh, I also might be doing nice. some traveling, uh, doing uh, some stuff for Ooh. work with our internship program. 
in Illinois sometime, maybe, possibly. You never know. Um, winter. Uh, and then, you know, uh, just doing some normal work stuff and uh, that kind of thing. Awesome. Well, uh, I think that about does it. You can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash pk54. Um, if you would like to chat about it, you can um, find us on our subreddit, which is reddit, reddit.com slash r slash thenexustv. Um, or you can tweet at us at thenexustv on Twitter. Uh, if you like what we're doing over here at the Nexus, um, swing on over to our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. Woo! Woot woot. Okay, everybody. Have a good one. See you in 2020. Yeah, have a good one. Hindsight's 2020. Watch out for <laughs> hindsight cars. Cars in hindsight. hindsight. You might not see them, but if you do, you'll see them in 2020. And you should watch out for them. Exactly. There we go. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence.